tonight we are starting in Psalms chapter 25. And the um, title of tonight's message is, The Lord is my teacher. So Psalms chapter 25, we're just going to read um, verses 4 and 5 first, which says, Show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. If we go down to um, verses 8 to 14 as well, it says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will shew them his covenant. And um, I came across these verses a, a couple of months ago, and it just really impressed me by the thought that the Lord, among many things, he is our teacher. In these uh, nine verses that we just read alone, we didn't read the whole chapter, but in those nine verses, the word teach came five times speaking about the Lord teaching us. And it just, um, at the time especially, encouraged me so much because I was thinking, well, it's time for me to sort of uh, break new ground in my understanding of the, of the Lord and the revelation of God. And these were the verses that sort of gave me the, I guess, the kick that I needed um, just to understand God's willingness to teach us to be our teacher, to be your teacher, to be my teacher. How privileged we all really are to have our own private tutor in the Word of God who will guide us through every step, through every word, through every test, every trial. You know, it's like when you think at school you have teachers and you have, um, you know, tutors and that sort of thing. You might have study buddies, but none of them are there for you when it comes exam time. You're sort of on your own and and that's it. You know, now's the test time. But even in the tests and in the trials of this life, our teacher is right there with us, revealing to us who he is, revealing to us his character and um, just revealing himself to us. So I was thinking, well, what is it that makes a good teacher so good at their job? You know, I went to school and had a lot of teachers, um, you know, from primary school all the way through to high school. And there are some that sort of stand out above the rest. There are some that are sort of head and shoulders above the rest and some that were not so great. And I was thinking, what is it that made the good ones really good at their jobs? And I thought, well, number one, they loved the subject that they taught. And I was thinking especially of this um, history teacher that we had at, at um, Nambour Christian College. And, um, you know, history for a lot of people is a really dry subject. I, I found it kind of interesting, but a lot of other people just find it really dry, boring. But she would teach it with such enthusiasm, her voice and her expression and everything. And, and the way she would teach it, you could tell that she was just so passionate about history. And she would try to enthuse you and make you feel just as passionate about it as she was. And it made her a really good teacher. Then I thought, well, the most important thing that made the, the good teachers really stand out were the ones that loved the students. You know, they were the ones that loved the teachers, but if they loved the students, they were that much better. The ones that had a sincere care and concern for the students. And I suppose that's why homeschooling, um, you know, wins in the end, because who loves the student more than the mother? Who cares more for a child's education more than the mother? And who cares more about our education? Who cares more about our understanding of the Word of God? Who cares more about the revelation that we have of Jesus Christ than God himself? It's no wonder he wants to be our teacher and he has taken it upon ourselves to be his teacher. He is passionate about the subject. You know, doesn't this describe the Lord Jesus Christ? He's passionate about his word. He is passionate about his way. He is passionate about righteousness. In Psalm 11 and verse 7, it says, For the, Lord, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. And in Psalm 33, verses 4 and 5, For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. God loves righteousness. He loves and he takes pleasure and he takes joy in beholding the upright. He loves it. Those that choose the way of righteousness, he just loves it. I imagine it just melts his heart when somebody turns to him and says, I want to know the right way. I want God to teach me righteousness. How glad it must make him feel when we submit ourselves to him. God is righteous. He is our righteousness and he wants to teach us himself. He is passionate about revealing himself to us. He wants to reveal 
himself to us. You know, sometimes we might read the Word of God and there are some things that are difficult to understand that seem a little you know, difficult to find. But God wants us to understand those things. He doesn't hide them from us in some kind of spite or, but because he wants us to seek him, because he wants us to seek him as our teacher that he might open it up to us. He is that good teacher that loves the subject and he loves the student, he loves us so much that he would draw himself unto us and that is why he wants to teach us. He knows how rewarding, he knows how pleasant and peaceful the righteous life is, even though we know at times it can be fraught with uh, temptation and trials and, and there's difficult turns along the way. But yet it is the best life. It is the way that pleases. It is the way that satisfies. It is the way that fulfills our souls. He loves his creation. It is his heart's desire to see us, the crown of his creation, walking in the way that pleases him and satisfies our soul. He wants us to know the truth because he is the truth. And the better understanding that we have of the word, the better understanding that we have of him and the closer we draw to him. That's why he wants to teach us. It is his heart's desire to be one with us. I'm reminded of those verses in um, John chapter 17 where Jesus was praying and his prayer was that we may all be one, Father, as thou art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, so the world may believe that thou hast sent me. His prayer was, I want to be one with them, that they might be one with us. Just as you and I are one, we want them to be one with us. That was his joy, it was his pleasure, it was his heart's desire, just that we would be one with him. His desire is that we would know him. His desire is that we would be one with him. His desire is that we would have that relationship, that sup with him and him with us relationship. That is his joy. That is his pleasure. He's so desirous of us to know him and love him and walk in his ways. That is why he wants to be our teacher. That's why he's taken it upon himself to say, I will teach you. I will show you the way to those who are meek. I will teach them to them that fear me. I will teach them. Why did he promise that? Because he wants to teach us. He wants to reveal himself to us. It is his heart's desire. And when I was thinking of that, I was thinking of uh, Proverbs chapter 1. And the verses there that urge us to wisdom, and what is it to, to know wisdom really, is to know the revelation of him. In Proverbs chapter 1, and verses 20 and 23, I was sort of thinking how much this shows God's desire for us to know him. When he says, wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. Wisdom is just crying out to us. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. <coughs> Who or what is wisdom? And I believe these verses will show us that Jesus Christ is wisdom, especially with the promise that verse 23, where wisdom is crying out and saying, turn at my reproof, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will pour out my spirit unto you. Well, who poured out his spirit unto us? God did, Jesus did, he's crying out in the streets. It must just pain him to see people walking in foolishness. When he says, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? It just pains him to see people walking in the way that is wrong and enjoying that and loving that way. What he really wants is for people to say, I hate this way, I hate the way of simplicity, I hate the way of foolishness. Lord, teach me your way. And that's why there he urges, turn you at my reproof. He's urging us, turn at my reproof. I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. I want to make known my words to you. I want to pour out my spirit to you. I want to be your teacher. If you will just turn and look at me. God is just waiting for the opportunity to teach us. How much does he just want that opportunity for us to open our hearts and have him be our teacher. He is just waiting for that opportunity to teach us. He's waiting and longing for people to come before him with their hearts open and seeking to understand his word that they might understand him. It's not just about understanding his words. It's not just about going to a seminary and getting your, your degree or or whatever the qualification is of being able to say, I've got this piece of paper to say now that I'm a, a theologian or, or, or whatever. He wants us to know him. He wants us to study that we would know him, that he might be able to unveil himself to us. He wants us to be like David and pray, just as David prayed in that Psalm 25 there, show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. Lord, teach me. Lead me in thy truth 
and teach me. You know, that kind of prayer must have just been music to his ears. You know, that same one that is crying out in the street saying, how long, you simple ones, will you love simplicity? For him to hear a man say, Lord, teach me your ways. Show me your paths. Lord, teach me. Just must have brought such a, a joy to his heart to hear that. He wants and he loves the opportunity to show us his ways and teach us in the way we should go. You know, even back in our unsaved days, we were still sinners, God was already trying to show us the way. If you look at um, uh, in, in Psalm 25 there and in verse eight, and um, one of the things that it said there, I'll just find it again. In verse eight, it says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, will he teach sinners in the way? So this might seem you know, strange to us because we understand that the Word of God cannot be revealed to flesh and blood. It can't be revealed to a person who is unspiritual. It is a spiritual book that can be understood by a spiritual person. So why would it say then that he will teach sinners in the way? And I was kind of thinking about that. It would seem almost unfitting. But when I sort of looked a little bit closer at it, um, I found that there are two words used for teach in Psalm 25 here. He's using two different words. We see the same word teach, but there's actually two different words for teach. And um, the one used in this context, in the teaching of a sinner, is the word yerah, which is a figurative meaning. Well, a lot of the Hebrew words have a figurative meaning and a literal meaning. The figurative meaning is to point. So this kind of teaching is referring to directing or informing or showing. And isn't that what God was doing to us even in our days when we were still a sinner? You know, no, we didn't understand spiritual truth. We couldn't understand the revelation of Jesus Christ. But how many times in your life did you feel like God was just trying to point you in the right direction? You know, didn't you feel that, that pointing or that leading, that I'm over here kind of call from God? And even when I was thinking about Romans chapter 1, and verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You know, everything that God did, the whole showing his you know, majesty in the world, sometimes I just think about simple things, you know, like you can look at something simple like a butterfly or a flower and you think, why did God put so much effort and, and so much beauty into something that's just going to die in a couple of days? Why, you know, why was it so magnificent, even the finest details, to show us him, to show us there must be a creator. Think about, you know, even the whole concept that we have a conscience that even before you knew God, you felt guilt. You still somehow felt accountable for wrong. It's just one of those things that God puts in us to point us in the direction to say, you're not complete on your own. You need me. You need a higher power. You need, you need something more. You need power, the power of God. Those things that he did to teach us. And I was thinking, doesn't that just once again show the love of God towards mankind that even while we were his enemies, even while we hated him, even while we opposed him, even while we were walking against him, he still was trying to point us towards him. You know how it is sometimes if, um, you know, somebody does the wrong thing by you and you might sort of get the feeling of just, just go away, just leave me alone, just go your own way. But that's not the way God was towards us. It was, he was still trying to point us to him, still trying to teach us. And when I say teach, I mean that point, that direction, that showing of the right way. That's what he did for us. You know, everything, the fact that somebody can stand there, an atheist, and say, there is no God. You know, I'd just like to say to them, hey, be honest with yourself. Do you really believe that? You can say that as much as you want, but don't tell me that you feel nothing for God. Don't tell me that you have not felt something pointing you to him. That's what God does. When a, fine, when a person finally chooses him, when they finally turn from their simplicity and turn at his reproof, he then desires to teach them in the way. And that's the sort of teach that we see in um, verse 9. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. So the word used for teach in this context, that is the context of believers, is different from that of sinners. And it comes from the Hebrew word lamad and means diligently, expert, instruct, learn, skillful, teach. So it's no longer just a pointing in the direction of there's the path, follow that, but it's a guiding and a leading and a skill and expertise. It's now a, a getting down to the details. And, and that's what I believe God does with us. You know, he makes us experts in his word, in his revelation, in the revelation of himself. So this reminds me of the often quoted scripture, study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, 
rightly, or that word can also be understood as skillfully or expertly dividing the word of truth. That verse is really instructing us to be skillful or experts at handling God's word through study. And study is really just simply allowing God to teach us. Study is just that reaching out to God. Study is that saying, Lord, teach me. Lord, show me your way. Lord, lead me on that path. Study is just the reality of what David was praying when he said, show me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. That's what study is really doing. It's just that outward expression of that prayer, Lord, show me. And that's really what it is. So even in this word teach, um, the primitive root of that is actually a word called goad, spelled G-O-A-D. So we're sort of looking that up and thinking, well, what's that all about? And it can be a stick with a pointed or electrically charged end for driving cattle or oxen, or like a prod. But it's also something that encourages, urges, drives, or a stimulus. And that there, I believe, shows us what God's teaching does. To those that are in the way, his teaching drives and it pushes us further along to him. God's teaching draws us unto himself as it reveals him. It draws us closer and closer to God himself. It reveals him to us. Isn't that why we want him to teach us? Not for an academic understanding or not so we can write some books that we can sell for a lot more money than what it costs to write them, but so that we can understand him, so that we can be drawn close to him, so that we can have the revelation of him. If we start to stray or if we start to wander, we might feel the stick, the, the prod, the electrically charged. You might feel that zap every once in a while, perhaps when we read the Word of God. It's not pleasant at the time, but the fruit of it is good as it keeps us in the body. Again, this is once again just the love of God drawing us unto Himself. But it's not all the time that we need to be chastened. Not all of us anyway. Most of the time, we just need God to keep on encouraging us, keep on revealing himself to us, keep on drawing us down that road, keep on drawing us closer to him. And this is what God's teaching does. And I believe this is the difference between God's teaching and the teaching that comes from the mind of man. When God teaches, he draws us unto himself by the revelation of himself. God's teaching shows us himself. In Hebrews, it says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, for whom also he made all the worlds. In times past he spoke by prophets. Today he speaks to us by his Son. How does he teach us? By his Son. Remember, Jesus Christ is the revelation of the Father. That's why he said to the disciples, if you, if you want to see the Father, just look at me. If you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And that is how God reveals himself, through his Son. And this is why he told his disciples, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Under the Old Testament, the prophets would speak, not according to the revelation that they had in their heart, but according to the words that God gave them, which was, thus saith the Lord. That's why they would say, thus saith the Lord to whoever, to, to Israel, or, or, or thus saith the Lord. And they would speak word for word what God had put in their mouths to speak. And he says, Jeremiah, I will put my words in your mouths. And they would speak word for word, not according to a revelation they had of him in their heart, but according to the words that he gave them. Um, they did not have that revelation themselves as we have of Christ in our hearts. So they spoke according to the words that God gave them. Today, there is no prophet who hears the voice of God audibly to receive the message and then pass it on to us. There are many who like to think of themselves as modern day prophets, like they are a mediator between God and man, standing between God and man. They teach and behave as though God has endowed on them a special gift or privilege to receive revelation from him above and beyond what the rest of us can receive. They're usually the ones that will preach from their dreams or their visions or begin their message with, God told me. God told me to tell you. Or they might be the ones that would walk up to a person specifically and, God told me to tell you. Or I had a dream about you. Well, why didn't God tell me? I'm listening. I'm studying. I'm praying. Lord, show me. Lord. Why didn't he tell me himself? But they believe that they are like this standing or this, this stand between God and you, that you can't approach God directly. You can't come before the throne of God. God can't teach you, so he has to pass the message on to them and then they'll pass the message on to you like they have some special gift. It was in times past that God spoke by the prophets. Today he speaks to us by his son. Unfortunately, there are many believers who have been fooled into thinking that they need a man to stand between them and God and tell them. Then they, um, then they will have this person just drip feed this information onto them. They don't understand God wants to teach them. God wants to teach me. 
God wants to teach you. You don't need a prophet to stand between you and God to relay the information. God wants to deal with our hearts individually. God wants to teach us. How many people look up to the preacher as being some high and mighty super spiritual person that they need to listen to? They have to buy all the books, tapes and videos in the hope they might glean some kind of revelation from them that they can't get from themselves. They don't realize that God wants to teach them himself and of himself. We're no longer living in the day where we need somebody to stand between us and God. God wants to deal directly with us, heart to heart. He wants to deal with your heart from his heart. He wants to deal with my heart from his heart. Today, God teaches by his son, and thus all those who have the son are able to receive the revelation that God has given them through himself. And as we read this morning, these things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing which we have received of him abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you. You know, in times past, they needed somebody who would stand between God and men. They needed somebody who would stand and say, thus saith the Lord, that time is over. You need not that any man stand between you and God. You have the unction. You have the anointing. You have the truth himself abiding in you. You have the spirit of truth that will lead you and guide you into all truth because God wants to be your teacher. God wants to be my teacher. You need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things and is truth and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. That's what his will is for us, that he would teach us, that spirit of truth would lead us and guide us, not have a man standing between you and God who receives something from God and then passes it on to you in their own words. He wants to reveal himself to you. The anointing which you received of him abides in us. What is it that abides in us? He does, the truth himself. He is the anointing, the truth is the anointing. And because he abides in us, there is no need for a prophet to stand between God and man and deliver the message on God's behalf. He doesn't need a, a mouthpiece. He doesn't need somebody to say, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord here. And the spirit of truth will lead us and guide us into all of that. He will reveal himself to our hearts. He will make himself known to us. He will be our teacher. He has taken it upon himself to be our teacher. So I was starting to wonder when I was thinking about these things, well, what is the place of the teacher? You know, Ephesians tells us he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. So I was thinking, well, what is the role then? If, if God can just reveal himself to all of us individually, well then, you know, why do we gather together? Why do we hear a preacher? Why do we hear a pastor? Why do we hear a, a teacher? I was thinking, surely the role of a teacher is to open up our understanding and stir up within us a hunger and a thirst within the believers who we might seek him and receive that revelation from him. See, a teacher can stand up here and expound the word of God for hours on end. We can have somebody stand up here and, and talk and, and preach and minister for three hours, but if your heart is not open, you will not receive anything from that. The teacher cannot put the revelation of God directly into your heart but they can open up your understanding and stir up within you a hunger and a thirst to seek God and say, Lord, I want to understand this. Lord, put that into my heart. Lord, reveal that to my spirit. Lord, reveal yourself to me. Surely if one is hungry and desirous of the revelation of him, then as they leave, it would not all be cast off. We don't just walk out of this building and go, oh, that was a good message, finished over. Hopefully next week will be just as good. But as we leave, it would not all be cast off. It would be something to meditate upon so that once again, God might continue to minister the message to the hearer long after the teacher has finished speaking and has finished teaching. God can still minister that message to the heart because he wants to be your teacher. He wants to reveal himself to you. The teacher is simply to encourage, bring something to meditate upon that we might draw unto God, that he might draw nigh unto us, that we might say, yeah, I love that. Praise the Lord for that message. Lord, put that into my heart, put that into my spirit so that it could never be forgotten, so it can never be lost. Minister that so it can become so real to me so that I understand it not just with my head, but with my heart so that it becomes my way of life, so that it affects the way I live. Lord, minister that to my heart. See, the difference between God's teaching and the teaching that comes from man is that God teaches us himself and he urges and encourages us in the way, drawing us nigh unto himself as he ministers his spirit to our spirit. A biblical teacher, that is a true teacher, a teacher according to the word of God, will encourage this, will lead everybody onto Jesus Christ, will point them in that direction, will open up the revelation of Jesus Christ to them. 
This is the difference between God's teaching and then the teachings of men or the teachings that come from the world. See, God's word urges us in our 1 John 4 and 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. There's a lot of so-called teachers out there. He's urging us, try the spirits, test which ones are of God, which ones are ministering of the spirit of God, and which ones are ministering from their own minds, their own thoughts, their own ideas. Try the spirits whether they are of God. The teachings of God will always draw us unto God. The whole purpose, the whole reason that God wants to teach is so that he can reveal himself, so that he can make himself known to you and me. So therefore, if that is his heart, if that is his passion to make himself known, then surely his teachings will open him up to us, will draw us unto him, will, will reveal himself to us. Whereas the teachings of the world, the teachings of man, seem to have the very opposite effect. They will appeal to the flesh and they will draw you down to the things of the earth. Because the spiritual truth cannot be ministered to flesh and blood, carnal man's message is never spiritual. It is of the flesh and to the flesh. Rather drawing us unto the Father by ministering his spirit to our spirit, their message always draws to the flesh. And I was thinking about this sort of thing, thinking, well, you know, perhaps we can put some of this try the spirits into practice just by the things that we have learned in the past. So I was thinking, well, you know, one of the subjects, firstly, the kingdom of God. What did man teach? See, quite often what man teaches is not something that he searched out himself, but something that he heard from somebody else, who heard from somebody else, who heard from somebody else. And after all this hearing from somebody else, it just becomes popular doctrine. It becomes the, the popular teaching. Well, what is the popular teaching about the kingdom of God? What is man's teaching about the kingdom of God? What did man try to teach us about the kingdom of God? Well, they will teach you the kingdom of God is something that you will be able to see with your eyes in the future when it comes. Because you can't see it today, it's not here yet. Therefore, you'll have to wait for the future before you can experience it. See, that's the number one problem with men's teachings. They go by what they can see, what they can feel, what they can hear. And if they can't see it, if they can't touch it, if they can't hear it with the physical, with the flesh and blood, then it mustn't be here. They can't perceive the spiritual things. So what do they do? How do they deal with that? Throw it into the future. Men's teachings say that when the kingdom of God does finally come, when you will be able to see it and, and experience it in the flesh, it will usher in a golden age which will satisfy the longing of the pride of life. When you're made a literal ruler over your own city, or if you're lucky, you'll have more than one city, many cities, depending on how good you are. You'll experience the high life, you'll eat the finest food, wear all the royal garb, and sit high and mighty on your throne. Now, is that a message that draws one unto God? Or is that a message that just draws us to the flesh? What did God teach us about his kingdom? What did he reveal to us through his word about his kingdom? Well, the word of God says that we were, past tense, translated on the day that you were delivered into the kingdom, from the kingdom of darkness, that we were translated into his kingdom, past tense. He said, you're there. <laughs> you might not be able to see it with your eyes. You might not be able to you know, touch it with your hands, but you are there. It is a spiritual kingdom. Thus, the kingdom is not a literal upon the earth, but a spiritual kingdom, which is made up of spiritual people now. God teaches us that we rule and reign with Christ in this kingdom today, not in the flesh, but in the spirit, as we have power and as we have authority over the flesh through the indwelling Holy Spirit, that is God himself, giving us victory over sin, self, and the devil. Now let's try the spirits here. Which one of those messages draws one to the flesh? the one teaching that's a literal kingdom. You know, which one draws one to the things of the earth? The one teaching you one day you can be a ruler over so many cities and you'll have all these little loyal subjects who will have to bend their knee to you. That just satisfies the pride of life, doesn't it? <laughs> it sounds good, it sounds great to the flesh, it satisfies the pride of life and it, and it makes man feel happy on the outward, but I don't think it really does much on the inward for him. And which one of those will draw us unto God? Which one of those will urge us in the way and encourage us to live victorious? The teachings that come from God, the one that God delivered to our hearts through his word. Try the spirits. One of those messages is about the flesh and the earth. The other one is about God. The other one reveals God. The other one urges us and draws us in the way. Think again of that word goad, that G-O-A-D word, goad, goad, I'm not sure. One guides, encourages, urges in the way. You are victorious today. You are ruling over sin, self, and the devil today. Keep going. You are more than a conqueror today. The other one says, don't worry about this one now. It's in the future. 
and you'll have the pride of life satisfied. Number two, in my father's house are many mansions. What does man's teachings, what is the popular belief about that today? Well, man's teachings say that one day when we die, we go to heaven and we're gonna have a giant house of our own to live in. It would be the perfect design for you. It will be positioned just for you with a view of the crystal sea, golden streets or whatever delights your eyes and will be furnished with, with everything that you could possibly want with, it, with your heart's desire. I was, um, a few months ago, um, Jesse DePlantis was on and he was talking about his um, experience when he went to heaven and it was just all flesh and I tell you what, it was just rubbish. There was nothing there for the soul. Uh, it was all about, you know, mountain views and mansions and, and it was just all of the outward, all of the flesh. That's what man teaches. Man will teach you if you're not happy and content with the home that God has given you here, hold on, be patient, because in the future there is one awaiting you in the sky. Well, I'm just happy and I'm just going to be content with God's dwelling that is given me upon the earth. What does God teach? Surely a spiritual person is not satisfied by the things of the flesh. So they'd feel the need to look a little bit closer in this verse and go, what would I want with a mansion in heaven? What's a mansion going to do for me up there? A closer look at the word mansion in that verse shows that it means a dwelling place. God's word also teaches what the Father's house is. It is the church. And when you understand that, you know, in my Father's house are many mansions and I'm going there to prepare a place for you, my Father has a place for you in his home, then we understand the love that God has for his people. His love for his people is so great, his desire to dwell with them is so great, that he calls the church, he calls us, the believers, his home. You know, what a privilege and what a, what a wonderful thing that is, that God says, you are my home. You know, when you think of you know, this, home is where the heart is, and especially once you've traveled and there's just always something about coming back to home. It doesn't matter if you've been five-star hotels, there's just something about home. And what does God say about his home? We are his home. The church is his home, dwelling among us. That just really, I think, gives us a taste of his love for his people, his oneness with his people. He has a place prepared for every believer in his church. I go to prepare a place for you so that I can come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you might also be. His home is not so big. It can't get overcrowded. It's not going to bulge. It is not, uh, there's never going to be a day where he's going to shut the door and say, sorry, there's not enough room in here. It's full. There is as many as who will love him and turn to him. So now again, let's try the spirits. One of those draws a person to the flesh. One of those appeals to the flesh. One of those also appeals to the future. Once again, if you can't feel it, touch it, hear it, sense it right now, it must be in the future. So one of those is not a reality for today. One of those will appeal to the flesh only. One of those will draw us closer and nearer unto God. Of course, the message of man always appeals to the flesh the message of God. When God teaches us, when, he, when we open the word and say, Lord, teach me what this really means. Show me this mansion. I want to understand this dwelling place that you have for me. When he leads us and guides us through his word and gives us the revelation, then we understand his love for us and his unity with us. We understand Emmanuel, God with us. Man's teachings on this subject makes God afar off. You're not going to experience the Father's house until one day in the future after you die but the other puts God among us and with us now, today, in my Father's house and many mansions. Number three, the rebuilt temple. What does man teach on this? Man's teaching suggests that one day in the future, once again, has to be in the future because you can't see it now, the temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem where Christ will sit in person and accept sacrifices of bloods, goats and bulls, the very sacrifices that his blood superseded due to their inability to take away sins, but hey, you know, Let's go back to the old way. Our worship will then revert back to Old Testament worship, that which the Word of God says was weak and powerless and in need of fulfillment. Does anybody even see any logic and reasoning in that? What does God teach us? God's Word teaches us. When we open the Word of God, when we study the Word of God, when we allow Him to reveal it to us, it teaches us that when we receive the Spirit, our bodies became a temple, not just singularly, but collectively, we became the lively stone which built up a spiritual house, offering up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. What does that mean? Only the spiritual sacrifices are acceptable to God. It's interesting in that verse, it says, offering up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. The only sacrifices that are acceptable to God today are the spiritual ones. But yet, what does man teach on this? That somehow this Old Testament worship is going to be acceptable to God. It wasn't acceptable back then. 
It's not acceptable today. It was his plan for the time back then, but it was not his highest plan for man. Our one message promotes worship emanating from the flesh. One urges and encourages us to offer spiritual sacrifices of worship from the heart that cannot be copied or learned by technique as the physical sacrifices can. One message promotes the flesh. One message promotes the spirit. Try the spirits. Which one reveals Jesus Christ to us? Which one opens his way up to us? Which one encourages us spiritually? The message that comes from God. The one that came when we studied his word. The one that came when he revealed that to us. And I remember the days when, you know, the, the times when we would understand these things from the word of God and think, wow, doesn't that suit the soul so much more? Doesn't that just fulfill? Doesn't that just make our soul so much happier to understand the spiritual reality than having this sort of one day you'll get to offer up an animal again? No thanks. Number four, ordinances, that is baptism, communion, feet washing. What is the popular belief today that has come from man that has been passed down through the ages? Man's teaching suggests that these are outward demonstrations which prove to the world that we are believers in Christ. If you want to prove that you're a believer, dunk yourself under some water, wash some feet, eat some bread and juice and, and you're done. You're proven. In fact, some of man's teachings even suggest that they are more than just outward. And they actually perform something spiritual, suggesting that physical means are required to move the spirit of God, that something God is somehow going to move through something physical. What does God teach on this? God's word teaches us the spiritual reality of each of these, that we were baptized by one spirit into the body, which is so much better than what any water can do, and washed by the blood of Christ. God taught us about communion, that every time we gather around his word and we feast upon his word and we study it and we seek and we say, Lord, teach us that we are then eating his body, that we are then being partakers of him so much better. What does God teach us you know, about feet washing? That we are servants, that just as he was God, you know, come in the flesh and was able to serve man, that was able to serve his disciples, so we are those servants. We have that very same spirit abiding in us. As you know, Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who you know, thought him, knew he was equal with God, but thought it not robbery to be made a servant to man. That same spirit is in us. Again, try the spirits. One is of the flesh, make it easy to accept. Anyone can spend a couple of seconds underwater. Anyone can eat some bread and some juice. Anyone, almost anyone, can wash some feet. But not anyone can feast on the word of God and eat that bread. Only the true believers can receive that bread from heaven, that living bread, that bread, you know, where he said, you know, these, the, this bread, the, these words, they are spirit and they are life. One reveals the heart of God's pe people which is the same in Jesus Christ, servanthood. One measures us up by the outward ceremony and ritual. One calls us to measure up by what is in our hearts. One challenges the heart and says, but do you feast upon the word of God? Are you eating that bread of life? Is that spirit and is that life to you? One tells us just bury yourself under some water. The other one says, be baptized into the body, be made part of the body. One says, just wash some feet. The other one says, be a servant. One calls us to measure up by our hearts, by our spirits. The other one teaches us to dress the outward, to look the right way. Man's teachings accommodate the flesh. God's teachings fill the spirit. Man's teachings make way for anyone, as anyone can fulfill the religion of the world in the flesh. Anyone can meet those ordinances. Anyone can, can do those things. But God's teachings bring a separation between the true worshippers and the pretenders. Again, man's teachings point to the flesh. God's teachings reveal his spirit to our spirit and draw us unto him and unto each other. As we draw unto him, we're drawn unto each other, aren't we? Surely, just from these few examples, we can see why God wants to teach us himself to not just accept a belief because it's popular. Don't just accept it because somebody wrote a book that sold for a lot of money and so many other people have accepted it. Don't just accept it because it came from Daniel Warner or John Wesley. Allow him to teach us, allow him to step us through his word and show us, allow him to then minister that word to our spirits, to our hearts. We receive it in such a way that it can't be taken from you. You know, that's the, the most wonderful thing when God teaches you something, it can't be taken away. Nobody can change your mind on that. 
if you're just hearing what somebody says and accepting it, well, you know, that can be changed and, and you can change your mind. But once God puts it to your heart, it's stuck. You know it is the truth. And somebody cannot convince you otherwise. Once he's revealed it through his word, once it has changed your life, it's there for good. It'd it take a lot to try to shake it off after that to walk away. But just you know, from these examples, we can see that God's teachings, when we allow Him to teach us, when we allow Him to step us through His Word, that it opens Himself up to us. It reveals Himself to us. It makes us those more spiritual people. It draws us close to Him. It makes us those better people. It, it fulfills the soul. It just makes us so much happier. It is so much more fulfilling and just brings so much more contentment. He wants us to seek the revelation of Him through his word, he wants to teach us of himself. And what an encouragement when he says, I will be your teacher. I will teach you. To those that are meek, I will teach them in the way. To those that fear God, I will teach you. Let me show you. You know, to, to the foolish, he says, how long are you going to love the simplicity? Just turn at my reproof and I'll make known my words unto you. And that's just the heart of God, you know, saying to us, just let me be your teacher. Let me step you through it. Let me reveal myself to you. It's so much better than just accepting what man has to say. God has issued that invitation to all of us. Let me be your teacher. In Revelations 3 and 20, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Isn't that the sort of unity that we want with God? Such a one where we sup with him and him with us. And what is that supping? What is that eating? What is that drinking? It is that eating and drinking of the word of God. It's that feasting around his word. And it is that revelation of him. He's saying, look, I'm standing at the door and knocking. If you open the door, let me come in. I will show you myself. I will teach you of myself. I will open myself up to you. There might be people that you've opened the door and they've come into their home, but you kind of sense a facade or like a blocking. They don't really want to give away too much about themselves. They might be hiding something, but that's not Jesus Christ. That's not his heart. His heart is let me in and I will show you as much of me as you want. You know, seek, study, let me teach you, let me show you the way. And just from those examples that of the trying spirits, we can see the big difference between when God teaches us, when he shows us himself, and when we just try to accept something that man has said because so many people have accepted it. God is our teacher. And we only have to you know, look back a few years and see that God has been our teacher. He has led us in the way. And when I look back at every thing that we've changed every time we've had to change something. He's never taken anything away from us. You know, when we learned what the rebuilt temple is really about, when we learned what the ordinances were really about, when we learned about what the heavenly mansion really is, it really just gave us something more. It didn't take anything away, but just it just drew us unto him, made us those better people, made us those happier people, and there's just no regrets about it. And so God is still today saying, I will be your teacher. He will be our teacher. Praise the Lord that he is our teacher. Amen.